everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce Anne Friedland today on behalf of Sultan Hamid. He had to leave on short notice. So uh, we welcome Anne Friedland and a few words to her previous work and uh, education. So Anne is one of the persons who have a BA in economics, but also a BS in civil engineering, which is a really neat uh, combination. Both obtained at Stanford University. And then she did her MS in hydrological science at the uh, University of California in Davis and came back to Stanford for doing her PhD in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, since then, she uh, was a postdoctoral fellow, uh, got an award from the National uh, Research Council, worked at NASA Ames, was there also a research scientist, and then she joined the NASA Goddard Institute in New York. She got a couple of fellowships and awards, she got a performance award from NASA, uh, Spotlight Performance Award, a Lieberman Dissertation Fellowship, prestigious, but also this prestigious postdoctoral fellowship. She's a very active member in our community, many publications, very nice publications, I have to say, and also a lot of services for uh, in committees of the Department of Energy, NASA, Etc. So quite productive. I'm very happy having you here. You made it out despite of all these travel issues. I uh, like you made it out too. <laughs> <laughs> in the aftermath of Sandy. So her talk today is the use of collocated observations from the TWP ice field campaign to improve cloud resolving models and study aerosol effects on tropical deep convection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. That's the, that's the extensive introduction I've received. Embarrassingly <laughs> so. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about the Tropical Wormhole International Cloud Experiment. Um, and, uh, and this took place in 2006 around Darwin, Australia. It was funded uh, by a number of agencies, but primarily the Department of Energy through its uh, program that was then called the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, is now the Atmospheric Systems Research Program. So I'm going to spend the first part of the talk, since I was asked to give an introduction to this, um, on that experiment and just a brief lead up to what we've done. And then I'll spend the second half of the talk on, on our most recent work on rain properties. And we're preparing that for preparation now. And that has to do with aerosol effects, essentially a foundation work for studying aerosol effects. So around Darwin, Australia, uh, here is the um, experiment. This is a sounding array, uh, a three hourly soundings during the course of a month long experiment, very expensive, and a lot of uh, instruments in the center. This point here is a ship. Um, and I'm showing here an MT sat satellite image, false color image. These are the Tiwi Islands shown here. So the, the uh, observational domain is right here. This is the sea pole radar, uh, which is uh, located in Darwin. And this is what it's seeing at approximately the time of this image. Um, and this is convection in the dark. Um, I'm showing convective areas uh, and the uh, hashed here uh, stratiform rain. And I'll say more about that in a minute and its relationship to uh, aerosol effects. And here are three different cloud resolving model simulations that participated in a cloud resolving model inter comparison study um, that I led, but thinks that we needed participants and equal authors here. So our model at GIS um, with, with two-moment microphysics, which can then uh, resolve or at least represent aerosol effects, uh, a French model, and a SAM uh, simulation. So these have different, obviously these are exact, the exact same time. We obviously don't expect these uh, structures to be in the same place, but they have different shapes. The MESO-NH model has a, a very uh, dispersed coverage of convective area. These models have more, um, these two have more uh, more um, squall line like structures at this moment in time, and um, but they still differ. So, do we uh, believe any of these are really realistic, and do we believe they can represent aerosol effects on deep convection? That's kind of the question we're trying to get at here. So, um, so I'm not I'm not going to linger on this. I just want to say that Peter May in 2008 in Bands published the experiment paper, and these are the instruments that were specially deployed just for this experiment, including the radio sonde array, surface flux network, and a number of profiles, including those measuring um, wind and precipitation, which can be used to 
um, assess raindrop size distribution properties that I'll be talking about later. Um, we also, uh, well during the experiment there were uh, five aircraft. I went to the experiment even, they invited some modelers, which was nice. And uh, so five aircraft, some of these were run by the uh, active campaign, which we were lucky to have uh, simultaneously running with TWPIs because in addition to uh, the um, more typical things for a cloud experiment, cloud radar, cloud ice cloud particle habit, and so on, these, um, these planes, the Dornier and the Egret, also measured aerosol size distribution. It's very rare in a detailed cloud experiment uh, covering deep convection to have aerosol information up to 15 kilometers. And this shows uh, some, an analysis I did uh, essentially uh, for three different cuts of uh, aerosols in, these, uh, in the measurements, from the measurements. And a, a simple, an idealization that we developed, a uh, trimodal aerosol size distribution changing with height for uh, cloud resolving models to use. This is the first time deep convection inner comparison experiment has, um, has had that available to it. So uh, uh, here I'll just note that many of these, um, all of these uh, data sets are archived for convenient public use at um, the arm.gov uh, ACRIF, so called ACRIF archive, including the cloud resolving model simulations from our inner comparison. Uh, there were about 50 publications from the TWPI's experiment. The green, as a function of year, shows um, observational. The modeling, these tend to come a little later after all the observations have been analyzed and processed and so on. And finally, the model intercomparison studies. Ours was just one of four. Others were for GCMs, limited area models, and single column models. So of the observational publications, I'll just note that most were about ice physical and radiative properties. Um, however, uh, the, the publication that received the most sites, um, unfortunately, is basically about how ice crystal shattering on the probe, uh, the main pro cast probe used on this experiment, really contaminated the ice size distributions. And so that's uh, the most cited paper from the whole experiment, and only the CPI, the cloud particle imager, ice number size distributions have been used in any of the modeling studies. So that's a little unfortunate because one of the main goals of the experiment was to both characterize the large scale environment and the anvil ice properties so that they could be connected, including those aerosol properties. Oops. So uh, modeling publications, here I'll just say, um, divided into topics. Uh, this is from a different talk I gave just on you know results of the whole experiment. So. Uh, but I just want to highlight one thing here that um, many of these are model inner comparison studies for all different types of models. This experiment was well designed to provide all the environmental data that such studies really need. Um, so, and, uh, so it's not just like one aircraft lying around and you don't know what the environment is in a detailed way. Um, and I will also say that the second um, uh, largest uh, um, or most commonly written about target here is specifically the cloud resolving model uh, studies, sensitivity studies that include aerosol um, variables like cloud condensation nuclei or IN. So people are very interested in this. Um, and again, these are the TWPI's um, aerosol measurements that we use to provide this. I just want to note that national aerosol size distributions are not the way people often think they are. Um, this is a, a greater than 40 nanometers number concentration with height. It is not a maximum in the boundary layer in these measurements, for instance. Um, but it does have a characteristic shape that's very different than the characteristic shape of the number of concentration of particles, profile shape, I mean, um, uh, larger than 10 nanometers. And these can get activated in strong uh, updrafts. So these, these things are important, I think. Um, however, they're not so important that all of these models can't simulate all of the cloud resolving models. Um, and these are all the simulations that were submitted to our inner comparison study. All of them can reproduce the um, precipitation rate when they're essentially, to within uncertainty, when they're run um, with periodic boundary conditions with a large scale forcing applied. And the reason for that is what we're essentially applying with using a relatively moderate sized domain and applying large scale forcing, we're essentially uh, applying a large scale ascent rate. And so for a, a highly saturated atmosphere, you will get that water out as rain one, or precipitation one way or another. But what I'm going to try to convince you of today is that the structures that deliver the precipitation, the convective and stratiform structures, are very different in these different models. I showed you that in the very first slide, where the heavy rain, these convective regions, um, are, uh, are very differently distributed in the models, and the stratiform areas even more so. So first, I just want to say that um, these models exhibit all of these cloud-resolving models. The ones represent um, dash one is a one-moment scheme. 
dash meaning it, uh, it carries only mass concentrations of each of the hydrometeor types. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. These others are two-moment schemes, so, um, which, uh, which carry both number and mass concentration for each of the species, uh, cloud water, rain, um, snow, and so on, cloud ice. Uh, so, but all of these simulations exhibit some well-known and very common biases we found in our extensive analyses of them. Our approach in this, inter in, in this model intercomparison was and a, a related study by Adam Barbel working with Ed Zipser at the University of Utah was not to compare the models to one another as much as to compare them all to the observations. And what we see when we do that is that all of the models, for instance, have a bias in the convective 25 uh, dBZ reflectivity echo top. And so they are essentially delivering too much, uh, they, they exhibit too much reflectivity. They have essentially, Adam traced this, in uh, one moment schemes to too much grapple or too large grapple, and in two moment schemes to snow reflectivity. And these, so these are the observations with the line, and these are, are um, all of the models. And so that's really a bias. All of the models, one moment, two moment, no matter what, they're all getting the right precipitation, but they have these biases in their representation of the microphysics. This is in the convective region. So a little more on the convective region. Uh, Convective region is sometimes, has sometimes in the literature been referred to as a particle fountain. And the idea here is these are your convective cells where you have the strong updrafts. And in these um, convective cells, and I really like this cartoon from Bigger Staff and House, the ice particles are formed. These lines are kind of imagined, simplified trajectories of these ice particles. And of course, there's collision coalescence and all these other things going on, so it's highly idealized. But the point is that the idea here is that the is that the hydrometeors are all formed in these convective columns and the rest is basically fallout, dispersion and fallout. And, and that is what creates um, the, the stratiform area. So it would be natural um, to consider that the properties of the ice that comes out of your convective cells can have a big influence on um, your stratiform properties. So this is a first, this idea of a convective region and a stratiform region, I think of if you walk up to someone who does radar data analysis and you say in a convective region, which I did with Ed Zipser, which is why we included this in our studies, what is the first order structure that you think of in a convective area from a radar standpoint? This is the answer, convective and stratiform. There is a transition zone that you um, kind of sometimes considered between these, and about that, I'll just say that the transition zone is hard to find <laughs> in, uh, in mid-latitude um, storms, um, and it's also, it's, I think it's even harder to find in tropical storms where we don't have so much this squall line structure with a line of, convect, of convective and kind of outfall stratiform. It can be more kind of the fountain is going everywhere in every direction. <clears throat> so we stuck to convective and stratiform in our analysis. So what we did here is forward simulate reflectivity. For anyone who might be thinking of doing this yourself, we also degraded the re resolution of the, uh, reflecti the forward simulated uh, radar reflectivity, Rayleigh reflectivity, to the observed um, reflectivity at 2.5 kilometer resolution. This is a, we applied a textural algorithm known as the Steiner algorithm, which is widely used in the radar community. It's very sensitive to the input resolution horizontal resolution uh, though. So, and then we applied it equivalently to our um, observational data set and to each of the model simulations. And what we found from that, and I think this is the first time um, something like this has been reported, it surprised me a little bit, is that the convective area, although it can be distributed differently, I, we, I showed the uh, um, cover slide, you know, isolated cells or more, um, or more uh, squall line-like uh, structures, um, the actual total air convective area, although it's biased high, these gray lines are all the models, um, although it's biased above the observations, which are the black lines, so almost all of these are above, it really tracks them uh, remarkably well. Stratiform area, not so much. And um, how you define details of how you run the algorithm are more important down here. But um, so, so the con these convective area columns cover similar um, areas in the simulations, although it's somewhat larger than the observations, and there's a lot of variability in the, in the stratiform area. About that variability in stratiform area, this is, um, I think, the last slide that I'm going to give on this intercomparison study, 
is that it is correlated. Um, well, first of all, it's not correlated with the convective area. So the stratiform area, these are a bunch of different models here. This dashed line is the uh, median, and I think it's the median and the standard. I, it's been a while since I wrote this, or the mean and the standard deviation. Well, anyway, oh no, this is the uncertainty. That's what it is. And, uh, so the mean and the uncertainty of the stratiform area and the convective area, just over the active region, when we had really a lot of rain and we expect these uh, structures to be very well developed, um, and, uh, and you can see that there's really no correlation here. This is the rain correlation coefficient. Um, however, if you plot the um, top of atmosphere outgoing long wave radiation versus the stratiform area, there's um, quite a strong correlation here. And, uh, and the models, again, there's some bias here. And in the paper, we talk a lot about um, whether we expect the stratiform area to be similar to the domain size, which is the size of the events that are observed. And there's many issues about whether we think this should agree with the observations. But whether or not it agrees with the observations in any single model, it is true that um, there was a strong correlation, you know, 60 watts per meter squared difference in OLR, strongly correlated with stratiform area. Offsets in OLR were, uh, in, a sing in models, we had models that run, ran, for instance, this is, um, these three triangles are the Met Office, UK Met Office uh, cloud resolving model, two moment uh, run, and then these two are one moment runs with different treatments of ice, and a change in OLR from one to run to another um, was consistent with essentially, and these dashed lines show one to one offsets in OLR or uh, reflected shortwave radiation. And at the top, so you can kind of see a one to one offset in OLR and reflected shortwave radiation. People often say that deep convection is, uh, from a cloud radiative forcing standpoint, neutral. And that is, that's this idea, um, essentially. So, and this just shows that stratiform, during the daytime, stratiform area and um, top of atmosphere shortwave albedo are also uh, correlated. So there's reasons that it would be good to know um, whether you're simulating stratiform area correctly and what really controls, controls it microphysically and what potential aerosol influences are. Um, uh, the, so actually one last point on this um, is, and this is just in preparation still, but we did make some effort um, using uh, to use uh, dual Doppler retrievals, radar retrievals of dynamics within these convective regions. And uh, so we're looking, we're basically trying to see whether the updrafts in the cloud resolving models really look like the updrafts observed in the field. Um, unfortunately, I think this work is inconclusive. It's kind of tantalizing. But um, the reason is that we have very small coverage of dual Doppler lobes, and we don't get a statistically uh, robust sample of updrafts during just a few uh, simulations. I'll show you in a minute. We have the same problem when we use uh, vertical profilers to look at a storm. You just have one little vertical profile, and do the big updrafts pass over it or not, you know? And so when you look at the 90% updraft diameter, you're like, well, <laughs> and, you know, it's, we know it's not robust. And so actually I'm curious to see what Adam Marvel ends up putting in his paper, but these are some preliminary results that suggest uh, that updraft size could be reasonable. And so 50% updraft diameter observed in dual Doppler with the black line, and these are all the models. The models are A, similar to one another, and um, B, similar to the measurements. And then there's a few outliers here when you go to the largest diameters. Um, However, if you look at the updraft strength in the models, it's really a lot higher than that retrieved from the dual Doppler uh, measurements here. So, uh, so then you might think, well, nah, maybe not. Maybe that's not, 90% uh, is looking better in some ways than 50%, at least in shape. But um, so this could very well be a real difference um, given the way we run the models and um, res resolution issues potentially. I should have mentioned at the beginning, these are all order one kilometer resolution horizontally. Uh, it's not a game changer in our simulations of, of with more resolution, it may, at least with respect to general properties. If I haven't actually looked at Adam's statistics, but so what? No, um, it's it is important to know what those updrafts do really look like because that's where the complicated microphysics go in goes in to create the beginnings of your particle fountain, where your particles are really created and then 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 they become dispersed. It's in those updrafts and. And so really the role of aerosols, I kind of think is, or I like to think of it as kind of hung on a hanger of a dynamical framework. Of course it's interactive, but we really need to know the dynamic, to be confident that we have the dynamical framework and then understand um, the microphysics that's um, happening within it or interacting with it. 
Um, and so, uh, so just a quick, very quick primer. This is a, from Rutledge and Hobbs, a, kind of a basic idea of a bulk microphysics model uh, with, or you could one moment, two moment with mass concentrations, and um, a two moment model would have number concentrations of uh, commonly represented hydrometeors: cloud water, uh, rain, of course, a uh, cloud ice, snow, and grapple. And some models um, slice and dice the ice in various ways. Uh, and so on, and maybe even have three moments, and so on. So, so, but each of these um, types is represented. And where do aerosols come in? Aerosols come in right here at cloud water. Hydros all cloud droplets in the atmosphere form on existing particles in the atmosphere, and those are um, we refer to that as hygroscopic aerosol activation. Um, we also do have um, aerosols uh, uh, that are ice nucleating, active essentially, and in various in various ways. These can go to form directly um, cloud ice, which can or um, snow or even grapple if they're interacting with raindrops, for instance. And uh, so, so this is this is kind of the points at which the aerosol is interacting uh, with the um, microphysics. So this second part of the um, talk here is uh, is basically, and I and I guess I let's see, I, um, yeah, the second. So the second part of the talk is. Um, is motivated, I, I guess I'd like to provide a motivation for why you might be interested in aerosol effects on deep convection. So first, um, uh, Wei Kuo Tao has a recent uh, review in Reviews of Geophysics, um, and, uh, he put, and he covers uh, the many papers that address the possible aerosol impacts on deep convection. And you, if you read this paper, you'll see the great majority of these papers are model-based. Um, uh, it's also been suggested that uh, GCMs need to include aerosol effects on deep convection in a white paper by Rosenfeld, uh, Rob Wood, Leo Donner, and Steve Sherwood recently. Um, and they suggest the following things, that, um, that aerosols um, induce a positive radiative forcing uh, by invigorating clouds. This is based on past work, a lot of it, again, model-based. Um, anyways, expanding their anvils, so essentially that fountain is different. You have smaller uh, particles, they um, and, and stronger, a stronger fountain, and they enrich the upper tremosphere and lower, lower stratosphere with water vapor. Um, it's uh, perhaps there's an excessive aerosol indirect cooling in today's GCMs, owing to neglect of aerosol deep convection interactions. Um, they suggest the, a potential importance for climate sensitivity and circulation. And um, they point out that process models still have a major void in the knowledge of mixed phase and ice processes, and they say, say that field experiments are needed. Um, a variation of near cancellation um, uh, of shortwave, longwave tropical cloud radiative forcing has long been known to potentially depend on microphysics as well. And you can read that at the end of Keel's paper from 1994, classic paper. Um, and there are, I will, I, from my perspective, the, the observational study challenges to support, um, you know, really understanding what is important about all this um, is uh, when you go to look for aerosol effects on deep convection, observational studies have trouble extracting an aerosol signal from a thermodynamic signal. So, you know, you, we have, there's, the um, atmosphere is obviously um, more than just uh, 1D, and so it's, it's really complicated to know what subtle differences in the moisture column and so on could have um, taken the same aerosol and produced an effect that you see. Um, second, um, these studies are challenged by the difficulty of establishing microphysical causes. And so we don't actually, if you don't really know what IN effects are on deep convection, um, then it's, you can't point the finger at one thing or another, for instance, necessarily. And these papers make these points. Um, and from my perspective, modeling study challenges have two, um, two main classes. Um, right from the outset, and that is first establishing whether simulated aerosol hydrometeor and dynamical fields are adequately realistic. So for all of these studies, should we, be should we believe uh, cloud resolving models? Um, and second, establishing representativeness of any given case. So you model a case, even if you believe your model perfectly, how representative is it regionally, um, globally, and so on. So, um, so what do I mean, I, I should have, in red here, I just, picked out this one because this is really what um, what I've been working on is establishing whether simulated aerosol hydrometeor and dynamical fields are adequately realistic. And I want to give an example of a case where I feel like, um, what do I mean by that, I guess. And so in, here's an example from an Arctic uh, mixed phase cloud. Um, this is from the Sheba campaign. It's a, quite an old case now, 1998. Um, a very appealing uh, thing about this case is that we had ice, ice nuclei measurements. Um, 
Well, at least that's why we studied this case. But we also have, uh, I'll just say, this is a um, long-lived, widespread, mixed-phase, optically thin strata stack over Arctic pack ice, clod top around 600 um, meters, and it's continually precipitating ice from a liquid-phase cloud for uh, 12 hours um, in this observed case, with a clod top temperature of about negative 20. So we know that all of this ice is formed heterogeneously. Um, I'll come back to that point in a minute. but. Uh, um, and so when we simulate, when we have enough IN, we had to actually multiply the IN by 30 to get this, but, but uh, the point that we try to make in this, um, in this paper is that, uh, that if you, whether you have too many or too few IN, essentially the ice size distribution just scales up and down. So if you know the ice properties and you basically get the dynamical properties, um, the, the solid lines here are observations of the size distribution, the part of the observations we roughly believe, and the liquid drops. We can essentially simulate this cloud quite successfully. We can re represent the liquid um, droplet size distributions, and we can represent the ice size distributions. We can represent radar reflectivity, and sorry I switched the colors here, but uh, in this case the shaded is the observations, the line is, is our model, and we can get the mean Doppler velocity. There's a little bias in the observations I didn't include here, but suffice to say, um, uh, we know a lot about the ice properties, and um, we have confidence that we can uh, reproduce the ice size distribution in this environment for a given number of nuclei. It's a question about where they're coming from, and, but uh, that's kind of another question. So, so that's a very simple cloud case where we're just creating cloud water and we're creating cloud ice, and that's it. There's no collision coalescence, no rain. It's really easy in a way. Um, and relatively, from a microphysics standpoint. Uh, um, and then uh, we have another paper recently by Alex Avramoff where we have a case rather similar to the one I just showed that includes snow. So then we have ice collision coalescence. So we kind of add that element and we show that we can reproduce um, the size distributions. There we have a little bit more trouble constraining the ice properties. But, but suffice to say, um, this is, uh, we're kind of, gaining ground, gaining confidence. And so what I'm going to do today is just zero in on uh, the, the properties of rain. So why do we care about the properties of rain in deep convection? Um, so May, uh, Peter May um, and colleagues observed that larger raindrops with increased, um, the, there are larger raindrops uh, with increased aerosol numbers over the Tiwi Islands. He used polarimetric radar retrievals for this. Um, and that these were consistent with simulations and expected weaker autoconversion. Um, in other words, um, it's, it's harder to form, I'll say a little more um, in a second, I'll describe these in a sec regar regarding that, but aerosol influence mechanisms then involving rain are that um, in the literature include um, uh, aerosol influence, uh, hydrometeor unloading, freezing of raindrops and rain, um, increasing updraft buoyancy, and rain evaporations, evaporation influencing cold pools. So at the bottom here, I'm showing a, um, a oops, I'm showing a plot from Sue Van Den Hever's group that shows the change in concentration of raindrops uh, with aerosol concentration. So when you have more aerosols, um, you, essentially, um, uh, you essentially have more cloud droplets. The more cloud droplets you have, the harder it is to form raindrops. And so you essentially end up with fewer raindrops. So your mean raindrop concentration drops. As a consequence, the raindrops that are there are involved in a more active accretion product. Actually, a lot of things happen, but uh, well, other things, sedimentation also plays a role. But suffice to say that the raindrops that you do have end up larger. There's fewer and they're larger. So they're harder to form because you have many cloud droplets which aren't easily interacting with each other, hard to get that collision coalescence process going, and so the resulting raindrops are larger. So this is a direct, a nice direct aerosol effect, and we're in the TWPI's campaign, we're in the tropics where we have an active warm rain process, and so we should be able to, um, what we're interested in doing then, I should say, is constraining a, a simulation where we have the aerosols, we're predicting the cloud droplets, we're predicting the rain, does our rain look right? And so we have three independent um, data sets to do this. We have the scanning C-band polarimetric radar, um, which uh, gets ring rate, reflectivity, and raindrop size distribution parameters. Um, and so from their uh, vertically and horizontally polarized returns, that sort of a radar essentially senses the fact that very large raindrops kind of flatten. The larger the raindrop is, the more it flattens. And so that's how that uh, radar 
um, is a very simple way to understand how that radar is sensitive to raindrop size and, can, and the retrievals can be developed based on that. The UHF and VHF wind profilers, and um, this is the UHF profiler, a picture of the UHF profiler um, at the Darwin site, um, are uh, different. They, uh, they use a Doppler technique, and so they're both wind profilers, and one of them is uh, sensitive to Bragg scattering, so it can essentially, from that you can essentially get the wind speed. Then you can go to the other uh, radar, which is uh, sensitive to the hydrometeors, the hydrometeor fall speed uh, spectrum, and you can then you can use the first one to subtract the wind from the hydrometeor fall speed and actually retrieve the hydrometeor size distribution. So, and you can use, you know, in both of these cases, you could people have developed different retrievals and so on and so forth. We're using Peter May's retrieval from the C-band uh, polarimetric radar and uh, Chris Williams's retrieval from the, the co-located UHF and VHF wind profilers. Finally, we're also um, going to use a distrometer, which is um, shown at the bottom here. This uh, instrument essentially directly uh, measures um, impacts of raindrops on its surface. Obviously a very small area, but makes a direct um, uh, uh, measurement of the raindrop size distribution. Okay, so, uh, so we have these three independent data sets. I don't want to linger too much in our model description. I'll say um, we're using the uh, DARMA cloud resolving model. It's a 3D model, which is important for deep convection. Um, uh, updrafts are very different in a 2D model. Uh, one, uh, it's using a domain size of roughly 200 on a side. With sensitivity tests, we find we can come down to a quarter of this domain, and for rain properties, that's just fine. Uh, so I'll show you some results with that. Periodic lateral boundary conditions, we're using this large-scale forcing that reproduces the observed rain. Uh, we're using two-moment bulk microphysics, which is, and many variations on it, um, based on uh, the Morrison et al. Uh, parameterization from WARF. Uh, version 3.3, I think, starting with that version. And um, we're also using bin microphysics, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. We initialize these aerosol profiles based on the measurements. Where you, then we, in both of the, whether we're using this two-moment bulk microphysics or bin, which I'll say I'll explain in a second, we're prognosing the droplet number concentration and accounting for aerosol transport and consumption, which turns out to be important. Um, so, bulk versus bin modeling. Um, again, I, I could give a several hour talk on that, but, um, but when we talk about the number concentration of particles, a bin model is essentially, um, uh, essentially, I'll start at the bottom here with the bin model, is, is dividing um, the, uh, si the rain size distribution into a number of different sizes or masses equivalently. And this is an example of a bin simulation, a box model of rain uh, from Axel Seifert's bin model. And you can get a, a very smooth, he has, he has a lot of bins in this, so he has a very smooth distribution of rain, in this case with three uh, peaks um, at different sizes of raindrop. Um, now, simplifications historically, um, I'll, I'll go jump now to the gamma distribution. This is widely used to represent rain, um, and it has three parameters, um, and not uh, uh, mu and uh, lambda here. And the simplified version, a simplified version of the gamma distribution is to set uh, mu to zero, d to the zero is one, and you end up with what we call the exponential distribution. The familiar Marshall-Palmer is an exponential distribution with a fixed intercept parameter value of this. You can have other exponential distributions and people have represent these in various ways. A fixed intercept parameter here, and I guess I didn't actually put it in quite the right spot, but uh, is, um, is, is shown here. These are some observed uh, size distributions Axel used in these, uh, in these tan or, or gray lines here. And, um, and then uh, the, uh, a Marshall-Palmer type distribution for these would, is just drawn on here in red. They weren't part of Axel's paper. But um, he fits a, uh, a gamma distribution, which has a single mode. And then he also, his bin model for the same conditions, um, or rather he, in this paper, he fits the, a gamma distribution to his bin model, which represents it approximately, which is the, and efficiently, which is the point of these uh, bulk parameterizations, versus a bin model where you have many variables to represent the size distribution at every size. So it's expensive, very expensive computationally. So um, a key uh, thing that came up in our study of, of rain here is, um, is, is breakup equilibrium. So um, does anyone know here, do, does anyone know here about breakup equilibrium? You know, widely familiar with it? Okay, then I'm gonna spend a minute on this. Um, so basically, uh, so raindrops, you know, raindrops do not form by vapor deposition. 
that would take like a week or something. There, there's a lot of water in a raindrop. So to form a raindrop, you need to get a bunch of cloud droplets together on the order of a million for a you know, decent sized raindrop. So, um, so basically, uh, this is a collision coalescence process of the, of the cloud droplets, form some rain droplets. As soon as rain, a few small rain droplets form, they start falling faster, and they start sweeping up all the cloud droplets under them, and so it's kind of a runaway process like that. Well, what happens, though, when they get really big is that when they interact with other rain droplets, um, that sometimes they um, sweep up rain droplets instead of cloud droplets, and um, at low, uh, at basically low energy collisions, this will just be another coalescence, just like the coalescence that went to form the raindrop, uh, sweeping up cloud droplets. Um, but if you have a high uh, collision energy, and this generally occurs when the two raindrops understand, understandably are more similar in size, you may have a coalescence or you may have a, a breakup occurrence. And this is extremely important to raindrop size distributions uh, because it is the only source, it's the reason that you have lots of small raindrops. And if you don't have this in your model and you don't have an artificial way to produce it, you will, this, well, from, if you're simulating this microphysically, you need this process to uh, get this size distribution right. And so, um, so uh, but the idea that, uh, there's a second very important idea in, um, in, in cloud physics, and that is that this process, if you have enough raindrops out there, results in an equilibrium. It comes to equilibrium. And that equilibrium size distribution is what Axel Zyper is simulating here. Um, and so this breakup, these breakups can occur in various ways depending on exactly how the two droplets interact. Some a, a filament, this is what uh, low and list call a, a disk breakup. Um, and so, uh, so there's these, these can be responsible essentially for, these, for the formation of these various modes and you can read a bunch of papers about whether these modes really exist and how big they are and why and all of that. So this is a developed area since of course rainfall is so important climatologically and we need to measure it a lot. So, um, Okay, so, so there's this idea, and so this idea of equilibrium is built into all cloud microphysics models. And what they do is they, um, they relax the raindrop size distribution, essentially, as a part of the coalition, collision coalescence slash breakup process to an equilibrium. Um, this is a mean volume diameter. And that volume diameter in the models, I'm, all the models I'm familiar with, is 1.1 millimeters. And so, um, so... Let's see, so that's, that's an important idea. Okay, so we'll set that aside for one second because now I'm gonna talk about what is actually retrieved from radars. And um, the polar metric radar, the radar community has developed a little bit separately from the cloud physics community. And uh, they are very interested not in mean volume diameter, which is essentially your you know, liquid water content divided by your number, take the cube root of that with you know, pi on six or whatever, and, uh, and there you have it. So that's, that's something that cloud models want to do, because they work in um, mass and number. Um, but the radar community knows that radars you know, are sensitive to d to the sixth, and they like to work in a more, a mass, more of a mass-weighted space. And so the retrievals that are available to us um, are retrievals of median volume diameter. Um, and, uh, and so this is the diameter. Um, it's actually really inconvenient for cloud modelers, but, uh, which is which uh, take the uh, total volume of rainwater, divide it exactly in half, and then, and then the diameter uh, that corresponds to that is your median volume diameter. It's kind of a historical thing, I guess, for radar people. So uh, I would say. And so then we have the generalized intercept parameter, which is a measure um, of, of number concentration that the radar community um, finds general. I guess, and essentially, this is the intercept parameter um, that a exponential size distribution would have if um, if its rainwater and fourth moment on third moment diameter um, were uh, this were the same as an exponential distribution. So it's it's kind of a um, it's a, a general. So this makes no. I guess I'll just say leave it at this. This makes no assumption about both both of these parameters. Make what I like about these retrievals. This makes no assumption about the size distribution of the raindrops. So whether you have a bin model or a bulk model or whatever. Um, oh, I forgot to show you the model results. <laughs> okay, so um, here's our first cut at comparing uh, values in the convective uh, region. So this is below our, our particle fountain and in the stratiform region. I'll come back to that in a second. First, you'll note that actually in the convective region, um, of course, our choice of the convective region is based on reflectivity. So it's not necessarily totally surprising that reflectivity distributions are similar. 
Um, but median volume diameter, um, at least its median value, which is shown here with the black dashed line for the model, a two moment model, and the shaded uh, line, uh, shaded values here are the CPOL radar. These are a lot of samples, 156,000 samples for CPOL. This is a great thing about a scanning radar. You get tons of data. You get really good, robust statistical sampling of those convective areas that you re really care about. Um, and so we can compare that uh, with uh, the simulation. And um, for this, uh, these are actually the only reason we have fewer samples for these <coughs> cloud resolving model results is disk space. We dumped every three hours instead of every 10 minutes, which is what we get from CPOL because we have a lot more variables, obviously. So uh, anyway, so uh, generalized intercept parameter from the model, though. Um, again, median looks uh, pretty good, but this is a little worrisome if you're thinking about aerosol effects on deep convection. Basically, order of magnitude differences of peak cloud uh, rain size rain um, uh, intercept, well, generalized intercept parameter values, indicative essentially of, of raindrops that are too, with too high number concentrations, as I'll show you in a minute. So the first, this is the first time I've seen this comparison. These are really new, I mean, recently. This is a really new data set. So the first thing you want to do is compare it to some other uh, data. The thing about our vertical profilers and our surface data is we don't get good, robust sampling of that uh, convective area. And in fact, we don't necessarily get very robust sampling of our stratiform area. Our models, um, here's our model stratiform area and our uh, observed stratiform area, even from CPOL. And I'm not, I don't have time to go into why we think there's some differences here, but um, suffice to say that we don't, when we see then reflectivity um, uh, from UH, these reflectivity differences, we're not really, we don't want to go in and directly compare D naught because maybe we're comparing structurally different things. So a solution then is to take, try to choose structurally similar areas within the stratiform area by choosing a uniform distribution of reflectivity within the stratiform area. And this um, allows us to essentially compare dissimilar measurements when we don't have robust sampling. So CPOL is our scanning radar, great number of samples. Here's our vertical profile, only 312 um, samples in this case. Um, that to produce a uniform distribution of radar reflectivity. So I guess what I just uh, to suffice to say here, when it comes to median volume diameter, that means size of drops, generalized intercept parameter, approximately the number concentration, um, we find that the, uh, that the UHF, DHF profilers tell you somewhat similar things as the CPOL. So this um, analysis initially gave us a lot of confidence that CPOLs were really um, retrievals were very similar to UHF, VHF. There is a 0.1 offset in uh, median volume diameter that I initially didn't pay a lot of attention to because it's within the uncertainty uh, reported for CPOL, although that's not a bias. Um, but I'll, sh I'll show you that there actually is significance, uh, quite a lot of significance to that when you start looking at rain number concentrations rather than generalized intercept parameters. So back to uh, the convective region now with what with some uh, confidence, a little more confidence anyway, about um, the CPOL uh, data. So, so now, that, now we go back to this, look at this convective region, which is what we're most interested in, the source of the particle fountain, and we say, you know, well, what is that, that we have all these rain, raindrop number concentrations? Do we have an autoconversion process that's too active or what? So, um, oh, I wanted to say one other thing about that. And um, this is really what started us thinking about breakup equilibrium, because another thing we noticed about this right away is that the median volume diameter in a, in a two-moment model that assumes an exponential raindrop size distribution um, with a, that imposes this um, equilibrium of 1.1 millimeters for, uh, for mean volume diameter, that should correspond to 2.2 millimeters in um, median volume diameter. So this is where equilibrium is, way out here. Equilibrium at two and a half kilometers never occurs in monsoon conditions in the tropics. I guess I didn't know that, and um, I, I don't see a lot of discussion of that. And so one of the first things in the literature, and so one of the first things we did next is just to, to plot the raindrop uh, mean volume diameter, which reaches 1.1 at equilibrium, just as a function, just a, here's a typical slice. And here is where CPOL radar retrievals. The radar has to look above the horizon. So our uh, retrievals are essentially two and a half to three and a half kilometers. And so now we can see where the equilibrium is happening. By the way, CPOL radar retrievals are used to represent you know, surface rainfall. In fact, surface rainfall is, um, is often, or at least sometimes, I should say, at equilibrium, whereas at two to three kilometers, it is not. Um, and so, uh, in fact, the sizes are smaller, just as we saw there. 
So the first, uh, well, the next step um, is, to, is to recall that we have that distrometer. It doesn't sample well um, in convective regions, but we do have data from it. And um, so we went looking for breakup equilibrium in a very sparse data set. We had 108 samples in the convective region with the distrometer. This is what the reflectivity, actually it's a pretty good distribution of reflectivity compared to our full model simulation. Um, and there we found breakup equilibrium at the expected value for a, um, for a, a, an exponential size, raindrop size distribution of 2.2 millimeters. Here it is. So things essentially evolve towards this breakup equilibrium. We see it at the surface. We don't see it at 2.5 kilometers. However, when we go to look at um, the mean volume diameter, remember the distrometer directly measures the total size distribution. You can get all the parameters you want from it. You can get the median, you can get the mean, you can get uh, the shape parameter, uh, lots of things. Um, so actually, uh, more than that in a second. Anyways, getting back to the mean volume diameter. As I said before, this is what models care about. This is really what they relax to. And so the model um, is relaxing to 1.1, but actually we see lots of values out to 2.6 or something, or sorry, 1.6 or 1.5. And so um, what does that mean? That this matches and that does not match. That a number weighted size doesn't match, um, the model doesn't match the observations, but this uh, more of a mass weighted size does. It means that the model is not representing the rain, rain, raindrop size distribution shape properly. And so if you look at these direct measurements of the raindrop size distribution shape, um, uh, basically, um, if we, uh, this, um, we can essentially calculate a gamma shape parameter. What I did here is just calculate it from reflectivity, D naught, and NW. That is a kind of a roundabout way to calculate it. I did it that way just for, any, for anyone who might be listening on the internet. Um, but I did it this way because uh, we can do this for C-pole, we can do this for the model, we can do this for everything identically. And so what we get from that um, is that at the surface, these size distributions are not exponential. They're curved, just like we saw in uh, Axel Zeifert's uh, simulations. And, um, and so uh, they, are, uh, they have these more gamma shaped uh, uh, curves, and these are the shape parameters that we get from that, whereas the model is always assuming zero. Um, so what is another thing that we did, um, again, this is kind of a new, a very new data set from CPOL, and I think a powerful data set. Um, and basically what we did is calculate from Z, D naught, and NW what the shape parameter would be that would match those. And what we found is that in both convective and stratiform regions, we found values of, say, 0 to 2. These are small shape parameters. Um, and you can see this one here was more like, you know, 0 to bigger than 10. So this is, uh, this is different. I should mention, um, and I should have emphasized earlier, that the CPOL retrievals using the polarimetric uh, variables um, are, do not assume a size distribution shape. So they're basically fixed to the, um, to, from what you want to, to what is measured, and, so they, and they don't assume a size distribution shape. They were developed using gamma distributions over a wide range of values, including larger gamma shape parameters. And uh, so there's, so this, and they, and they do not re retrieve, they specifically do not retrieve the shape parameter because they know that they can't retrieve the shape parameter very well. But it can't be avoided that if you're using this to tune your model and you're matching those two things, this is the shape parameter that you would be matching. And so does it, how realistic is it? So from our other two independent sources of rain uh, size distribution, here's sea pole and here's the other ones. Um, uh, this is in stratiform columns, all the samples now. And what you can see is that these wind profilers, the two wind profilers, which use the Doppler technique, the direct measurement using distrometer and CPOL implied values, um, are um, these two match? This one does not uh, match these so much. Um, there's, so that's, uh, um, and I, I should also say that, um, that the distrometer and UHF VHF profilers are similar to other uh, papers. This is using a video distrometer, a different type of distrometer. Um, and, uh, and so, um, almost at the end here, the <laughs> shape parameter, I'll say briefly, from our bin microphysics lens, um, is, gives a little bit of interesting, um, kind of splits the difference a little bit. Not that, you know, the bin model's real, no, in fact, our whole point is to evaluate the bin model here. Um, but we see that um, at the surface, our uh, bin model essentially does produce a range of values that's similar. We tend to be, so, however, smaller, and this is a very, you know, small distrometer uh, sample size, 
So maybe something going on there. And, uh, and the median values do, however, match uh, remarkably well in the stratiform area. Uh, when we move up to 2.5 kilometers instead of the surface, and this is, again, native, mo uh, I should have mentioned again earlier, we're using native model resolution here. Here we're using a degraded model resolution. So our median in the model goes from 2.2 to 1.8. So it's getting, um, it's getting uh, broader. The size distributions are getting broader as you go up and you average them out. And um, in fact, at two and a half kilometers in the um, convective region, this starts looking a little bit like sea pole. So, um, so what was worrisome though about sea pole is that um, in the stratiform area at two and a half kilometers, there were large differences between UHF, VHF, and uh, and um, sea pole. So it's so that's what we've learned so far from this um, fairly exhaustive comparison. Um, this shows just a final point on that, our bin simulations in the stratiform region at three different heights, 4.4, 4, 2.5, and 1.7 kilometers, all the samples, not, again, a very statistically robust sample here, but um, good similarity, but again, we're always um, quite a bit lower, so except at four kilometers. Um, so, um, so, things that remain. Um, one thing is the fact that whether we're talking about our bin microphysics uh, simulation, which does a pretty good job on shape parameters when you calculate them, um, but actually has an interesting mode of small, uh, small particles here that are just not seen in CPOL. In fact, the bulk simulation actually looks quite a bit better here. The bin simulation has to get to equilibrium all by itself and do everything else all by itself. So in some ways, whereas many aspects of a bulk model are based on directly on observations. So this may not be entirely a surprise, um, and we're um, looking into this, and uh, I can say more about that to anyone later who's interested, but suffice to say that um, what remains very of a concern to me is, are these large raindrop number concentrations here um, realistic or not in the updrafts in the simulations? And, um, and one thing I'll just note in updrafts is that when you're in an updraft, essentially, you have an active warm rain process that's driving you away from equilibrium. These two things are updrafts. This is a downdraft. Come back to that. Um, so this number concentration of raindrops becomes large. It drives um, your uh, median volume diameter down, and those raindrops are forming where you have QC and where the number concentration of cloud droplets is falling. Um, and if you look, um, instead of looking at the sepal retrievals, uh, you look at UHF, the, our wind profiler retrievals, and you, in a very sparse sample, now we're getting you know, 15, 22, 23 samples. So that's how infrequently, uh, really, convective region goes over profilers, generally speaking. And, uh, and suffice to say that um, we actually are seeing, you know, we do, these numbers are measured by the wind profilers and the distrometer in number concentration space. This one's a direct measurement. These two are um, a retrieval, assuming, again, the distribution where gamma can become large and small. So um, anyway, so this is, the jury's still a little, I think the, you know, we have a sparse amount of data, and that's the best way to put that. So um, I'll just mention that in downdrafts, uh, that the raindrop numbers, this is a downdraft here with these blue uh, values here. And in, rain, in, um, in our simulations, that a downdraft a raindrop uh, median volume diameter is set directly by melting grapple, um, and in the stratiform region by melting snow. So uh, bin microphysics, I'll just say, um, I, without going into a lot of detail, produces the generally the same patterns. So here's our raindrop. You know, we have updrafts. We have this high number of concentrations. In downdrafts, we have a grapple that essentially sets our rain size distribution that way. But one thing we noticed in both our bin microphysics simulations and our bulk microphysics simulations is that aerosols are consumed in the updrafts. And that's actually really important to the number concentration of raindrops that you predict. So I think that the most modern um, papers uh, that just use models are accounting for this. But suffice to say that when you went from a million cloud droplets to a raindrop, you consumed a million aerosols. And then it dropped away. The, you know, the precipitation dropped away. So in the simulations, if you just do a cross-section of our aerosol number concentration, we started out with those three modes. This is just the total number. And you can see those high concentrations you know, from the small aerosols in the free troposphere. And in our updrafts, um, and this, uh, you basically have almost complete consumption, or you know, consumption down to very small um, aerosol number concentrations. This really depletes um, your cloud droplet number concentration. That drives rapid autoconversion. Um, with larger cloud droplets um, and fewer of them. In, uh, 
So, so suffice to say that we think uh, this is very important. This shows an example of a bulk microphysics run with no aerosol consumption. So you don't see those, um, you only see transport of the aerosols. And, um, and there's a qualitative difference in the cloud droplet number concentrations and the rain uh, number concentrations. So, I think I'll just go straight to conclusions. Finally, uh, breakup equilibrium uh, we found is rare at two and a half kilometers in the sepal retrievals. And what we're really seeing there is a transition zone with smaller drops produced by auto conversion and updrafts and melting grovel and downdrafts. It's seen at the surface, but it's different from what it's uh, used in a lot of models. Sepal retrievals suggest near exponential raindrop size distributions, unlike these other data sources, which are more consistent with larger. Um, basically narrower size distributions, I should say, larger mu values. And aerosol assumption associ consumption associated with cloud droplet number loss is key to the patterns of NC and NR that are predicted in the models, at least. But observations are sparse and maybe ambiguous. So that's where we are now, Kat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this nice seminar linking the importance of aerosols with cloud formation and precipitation. The floor is open for questions. No. Ah, here. Yes. Is there any account result model that can produce the size distribution of this type of uh, cloud, liquid, cloud droplets? Well, I think, I actually think that um, we're at a stage, this is, I mean, this is the most exhaustive comparison I've seen <laughs> that we just did. And, uh, but I think, and I'm hoping that, I really think that cloud resolving models are tantalizing. They look, they're seductive. They look so realistic, you know, but then you look at different ones and they look different ways. And actually, if you scratch the surface even a little bit, next time you pick up a cloud resolving modeling paper that say aerosol effects on deep convection, ask yourself, do I believe this model? Has this paper given me any reason to believe that the size distribution of, of cloud droplets, rain droplets, cloud droplets are really hard in deep convection because they're, you know, you have all this stuff in the way, all this precipitation. But do I have any reason to believe it? And almost never is there really, a, you know, a, 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 you know, any proof from observations for that case or really any case. So people are relying on a history of numerical weather prediction models and so on that um, I have the biases I showed, you know, we know s snow and gravel was too much of it, and you know, all sorts of problems yet to be discovered, I think. Because you don't know the uh, convection for this project, okay, Melbourne has some portion of ocean and also some portion of land. Yeah. Okay, if you compare over the land, the convections of the land probably will be less aerosols of the land, um, probably more of the ocean. If that's the case, we, we can make the difference. Okay, my question will be, if the same type of deep convection over the land will be last a shorter in time uh, than... Oh yeah, I think it will, and definitely it'll have different properties, and that's a great question. This was an active monsoon period we looked at, where we think it's like the land is totally saturated, so there's a... So we think it's fairly uniform, and we did just kind of an ocean surface layer, but that's a good question. And, uh, but that suggests the aerosol not just come from locally or local uh, oh. surface, or some other sources for the aerosol to ingest into the convection. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of long-range transport. You know, I mean, we saw how there's a discontinuity right above the boundary layer, and you see that a lot over ocean surfaces. So I think definitely those aerosols are being entrained and we plan to look at that next. But um, we've done a little bit work on it. We haven't analyzed it very extensively. But yes, I believe you know that uh, our story of this, about this project is actually uh, devoted uh, partly for the MGO event. Ah, because yeah. MGO convection systems uh, tend to last over days. Oh, yes, yes. Convection, but for typical convection, a single uh, body could be served in this one hour. Not sure, not longer than a day. But with the MGO deep convection, uh, tends to last a long time in the river. Oh, that's really interesting. But, but, but for this one, I don't think that's uh, part of that large or deep. So I would say, yeah, actually, what we did here, which I didn't mention, is that we relaxed the aerosols with a six hour time scale to so the observed condition. So it's kind of like assuming that in the monsoon condition, you're kind of in a steady state. you know, And so it allows us to develop those local depletions that are quite complete. 
but it allows us to account for the fact we do not have an online chemistry model. You know, and even if you did, <laughs> it'd be pretty challenging. You know, because you're forming aerosols and the anvil outflow, and it's just a mess. <laughs> so, so that's what we do. But that's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. So these are more like a little more like MGO, if it's a steady state using relaxation. <laughs> Yeah, I had a similar question in a way how the aerosol composition or aerosol type plays into a role. And you didn't mention that a lot. Uh, and maybe to frame it in a different word, how do you initiate the water uptake or the ice nucleation? Uh, how do you do that? What do you assume? Is that 100% relative humidity, or you say it's sea salt and then it starts at 75% relative humidity? How is that initial process? way before you come to the microfilter scheme, how is that initiated? Yes, so we're assuming basically what we did here, and we've never really, um, is it, well, I'll just say, we assume entirely, we take a dry aerosol size distribution from measurements, and we assume entirely ammonium bisulfate. Oh. So, and that's a first order thing. We could easily vary that and look mm -hmm. at differences, but, um, and that, to me, that would be a similar, potentially, to varying number concentration. You know, so and then actually, I'm really, I'm really interested in just knowing if we get kind of the baseline, you know, kind of in the ballpark. I'm mostly interested in that from the microphysics perspective. So I'm a little more interested personally in the ice uh, formation question. And so we are using right now our own. We have no IN measurements. Um, even if you do have them, you know, they're really sparse a lot of times. We have them for the crystal face experiment, um, which is rare. And uh, so anyway, they're sparse and they don't. As you, you know, they don't inform, they don't give you enough information for a model. They don't measure activation spectra, they don't measure mode of nucleation. So we have our own way of constraining, I mean, we have developed a parameterization that is designed to limit the number of IN that you activate based on the CFDC measurements. And we allow, that we kind of treat things like dust that would create CCN. So we assume that everything is equally likely, and then we often run sensitivity tests, like if it's only this mode, if it's only that mode, if it's only the other mode. You know, so in our Arctic case studies, unless things are acting in the contact mode, we found it really didn't matter what mode they were acting in. And when you're thinking about a case study where you really want to constrain it with measurements, then you're mostly, which of those modes was active didn't matter so much, but what mattered is how many IN you believe that cloud can access. So it's kind of a numbers game. And then, and for Arctic clouds, they can consume really efficiently in any of the other modes. Um, but, and so for deep convection clouds, I don't know as much about it yet. And actually what I've been working on, I mean, to me, this is part of a framework. And the next thing uh, we're doing, well, we've done some parallel studies using satellite data to constrain ice cloud top size, um, which is not trivial actually. And then, I mean, MODIS has retrievals, but there's a lot of assumptions that go into them. So, um, so we want to put, so I'm kind of trying to build a structure where we can constrain things observationally in a detailed way within the cl different cloud structures and then kind of moving into these things. So I could do a bunch of sensitivity tests, but I don't know if any of them are even in the ballpark. What does that mean? I mean, it's still interesting and important, but for me, I really want to prove that some sort of you know, that, 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 certain, that certain processes are acting this way or that way or whatever, that we, that we can have some confidence that any of the simulations are yeah, realistic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There another question? Audience? I mean, I could have, have many questions. I pause one more and then we finish up. You mentioned briefly in the baseline case for uh, bin microfilms, you had more smaller droplets or rain droplets yeah. in the measurement. Yeah. Is that due to coagulation processes or something? Well, like the first that? thing we did, stick together yeah, the models? first, bin models are known, this is getting into the nitty gritty, that is, yeah, but suffice said, to, yeah, short maybe, sentence, I just want bin to models are known to be numerically diffusive, and so one of the first things we did, so you can get overactive rain production, one of the first things I did is go back to, there's something known as a Golovin kernel, and it's an analytical solution for an analytical collision kernel. So we, you know, we adjust, we, and actually, interestingly, Kine, Alexander Kine has a paper out recently looking at high supersaturations, and they recently looked at theirs, too. So as soon as you start thinking about this, you start worrying about your numerical diffusion, which people were already worried about, rightly so, but still. So, so, but here's the thing. Say you ran with 99 bins, which we can prove reproduces, you know, that's like, it's very expensive uh, in a supercomputer, and you, you know, but you're really confident that you, um, that you're doing the physics, there's no numerical diffusion, let's put it that way. 
Well, now you're dependent on your um, collision coalescence kernel. And how well do you know that? You know, and so it's so that could easily be leading to the small droplets. I don't know what's causing it, but what I'm really excited about is to have an observational data set that alerts me <laughs> that this may be a problem. You know, and a few observational data sets where even if they're sparse, you know, because we looked, Seafall actually doesn't see those large numbers. Oh, right, we're talking about the small sizes. Oh, well, I think those are associated with the large numbers. But you're right, the small sizes are not seen in either of the data sets. That's right. So we're still kind of working out where they are, too. It's like where, you know, so, so, but it's actually harder to tweak a bin model because you're getting someone's whole different kernel, and so that's what we will do that. But with the bulk model, we've already tried different co you know, collision coalescence kernels. You can use one that's less aggressive, and away goes the large droplet number concentrations, you know. Is it so then you start, you know, so you can, and we're playing that game, and we're trying to tune our bulk model essentially to these observations. And that's useful, I think. Yeah, indeed, yes. All right. So ah, there's a simple question. Okay. So you're looking at the uh, Darwin area, but do you expect any difference if you're looking at other regions? Yes, I'm really excited to look at the MC3E data set, which has just come out of ASR, and we got some funding to do that. They, uh, they, um, they almost forgot to measure aerosols above the boundary layer, but we reminded them. <laughs> so, because it's still, it's interesting. Like, I think the weather people, or people, even hydrologists who are mostly interested in rainfall, you know, forget to get, we, that we want to go soup to nuts. Unfortunately, they got two instruments, which they like was a last minute add-on to the experiment. Basically, one of them didn't work the first half, and the other one didn't work the second half. And so it was like the CN and the large size, you know, the large particle size distribution. So. So anyway, so I'll see, hopefully everything looks the same on all the days or something. I don't know what I'm gonna find out, but so definitely we wanna look at that. And there I expect to see a much bigger role of the ice processes. That's what I'm expecting over land with much stronger updrafts and colder temperatures potentially, depending on the case. All right, and with that we conclude. We thank Anne again for the nice seminar. Sorry,